The screen you see here is the instrument control for operating the time of flight mass spectrometer. You can see that there's a, a really a large number of variables that can be controlled in here. We're not going to change any of these, so in other words, we've already optimized the parameters that are, that are required to get our best signal. So if you already have that done, then it's, it's really simple. Besides entering a, a file name, all you've got to do is, is turn the instrument on. So you click operate, and uh, if our sample is flowing into the instrument, you'll start to see a mass spectrum. You can save this for any period of time, uh, and then we can process the data from there. So the data processing tool will look like this. You can open your sample, and uh, the, the window above here uh, actually shows your, your signal as a function of time. So if you notice the axis here, this is time, and this is what we would call a total ion chromatogram. So it's the sum of all signals or at any given point, and then you just plot this over time. So right over here is when a sample was, was squeezed into the instrument, and then uh, we, we switch to another sample, and, and we work our way down the line. So if you wanted to, to know what, what was happening over here, so you would essentially integrate all of the, the mass spectra from there, and this is the, the plot that you would see. So this is our mass spectrum that we, we recorded over about a one minute period or a 30 second period. Um, and on this axis, we have mass over charge, and then we have intensity going over here. The first sample that we're gonna be recording uh, is a reference standard. So this is something that we are using to calibrate the flight time of the instrument. In other words, these are compounds that we know what the mass is, and uh, by spraying these compounds into the instrument, depending when they're detected, we get an accurate calibration of the instrument. And you might be wondering, well, the flight tube, isn't that a constant? The, the people that made this machine, don't they know exactly how long it is? Well, that's true, except the tube is made of metal, and metal expands as a function of temperature. So it doesn't take much. We really need an accurate measure of that flight time. So we need to know exactly how long that tube is. And the best way to do it is to just feed the instrument a sample where we know the mass, and we lock all of these masses in so it's, it's perfectly calibrated. The pattern that you see, uh, you should notice that there's an even spacing between uh, and if you, you look up the mass or calculate the mass difference, it's about 68, uh, or more precisely, 67.9874. Uh, we know exactly what this compound is because we're the ones putting it in, and this is what it is. So it's sodium formate, uh, and you're saying, but wait a minute, sodium formate, or, or sodium formate with an additional sodium ion attached to it, doesn't it have one mass? Yes, it does. Um, but, but what we're looking at here are different clusters, so it's not just one formate ion, it's, it's two or three or four kind of glued together. So that electrospray process where I said in the end it generates a single gas-based ion, sometimes it generates dimers or trimers, that depends on the compounds that we're looking at. This one here really likes to form these clusters, and it's perfect as a, as a tool to accurately calibrate the instrument. All of these masses are actually built in, so it's just a matter of telling the instrument during the calibration, this is sodium formate, the masses are, are, are all written down there, so the instrument knows what they are, and it locks them in, and then it, you can just calibrate the instrument. So you click that, and now our masses are, are perfectly bang on. Now let's look up one of these ions, so just taking a closer look at that, that sharp little point uh, of mass that we've observed right here. So you'll notice that the mass does have some width to it, and the, 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 the mass that we're recording, or mass of charge, is 362.9. Now I guess the question is, can I put more decimal places on that? So if we zoomed in further and look at the mass now, um, then it's written as 362.926. And in fact, I can tell the instrument display up to six figures. So those figures are already there. It's just a matter of whether you want to see them or not. So how many digits to put, and, you know, do I want to put the extra digits after here, depends on whether I rely, whether I trust those, those numbers in the first place. And all that really has to do with deciding what the top of the peak is. So is it here or is it here? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of everywhere is along that, along that, that top. So I can't really go on forever. Uh, but putting it to three digits seems about reasonable. There's the, 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 25, uh, 925, this would be 930, so it looks about right, uh, but it would be difficult to lock that in with an extra digit. <clears throat> now let me talk to you about resolution. Uh, so resolution is a way of measuring essentially how sharp this peak is. You've probably encountered this with chromatography. Now we're applying it to these mass spectra, and the easiest definition to describe resolution 
uh, is actually to look at the width of this peak in relation to the mass that it's, that it's being detected at. So there's our mass. Um, so the width of the peak, we, we take it at half height because, of course, if we take it at the base, then the width would be a lot harder. Um, so we're going to take the width at half height uh, and figure out what those numbers are, and then you calculate the mass difference between it. So this difference is going to be our delta M, and our mass will be this one right here. So if we were to calculate the resolution uh, as M over delta M, you'll see it's a little bit higher than 4,000. I mentioned in a previous video that these, this instrument should have a resolution of a lot better than that, maybe up to, to 15,000 at max, 10,000, something like that. Um, so this instrument today wasn't operating uh, optimally, but it should be able to do uh, a very good, good number. So 4,000 is still a, a very respectable number. Now, we can talk about the width of the peak, but what about the position? So, in other words, how accurate is our measurement? Uh, and we looked in and just sort of decided how many decimal places, but if this mass is way off, then we won't need to worry about how many digits we write in, other, in, in, in recording this mass. So, let's just say that the next time I run this spectrum, it showed up over there, and, and then over here. So it could bounce around. So that would basically be a function of how well we calibrated the instrument. Now these are extreme examples, but in fact the instrument does not bounce by that much. The, the variance on these, these measurements uh, should only be within 10 parts per million. So if you do a calculation and convert that to absolute mass units, we're looking at 0 .004. So on that third decimal place, in other words, there is very little wiggle room. I'd have to zoom back in. It is not anywhere near the measurements that I put right there. So to sum all that, it means that you should be able to trust the third decimal place on our measurement, at least at this particular mass. Okay, what else are we looking at in the mass spectrum besides the width of that peak? Well, you should be noticing these little peaks that are hanging out uh, at a mass slightly higher. And by slightly, I mean one mass unit higher. Uh, and then another one, one mass unit higher than that. And this, you should realize, corresponds to isotopes. So we've talked about isotopes going way back when, uh, and you should realize that many elements have different isotopes. Some of them only have one. So sodium, for example, only has uh, sodium-23. Uh, but we have all of these other ones. So carbon has carbon uh, with a mass of 12, approximately, and a mass of 13. I shouldn't say 12 approximately because it's exactly 12. Um, so all of these isotopes are present, and they're present at different abundances. So hydrogen, the deuterium isotope, uh, doesn't have a very high abundance. Um, for carbon, carbon-13 is about 1%. Um, different isotopes are a lot higher. Down here for bromine, we have bromine-79 and 81, and they're present at approximately equal concentration. Um, but all of these things are what gives rise to these different isotopes. If we have a bigger molecule, then you would probably expect the intensity of these isotopes to increase. So here we're seeing there's an increased probability of having some carbon-13 or some deuterium, um, or down here we could have oxygen-18, or any number of combinations to get rise uh, to these compounds with an additional mass. <clears throat> This one looks like a strange isotope pattern. It seems like it's down and then up and down, up, you know, back and forth. Um, but this is clearly not an isotope pattern, and I can tell that because of the spacing that's happening between here. See, if you think about an isotope, we're essentially looking at, at adding one more neutron, or in other words, approximately one more mass. So isotopes should appear one mass unit apart. Um, what we're seeing here, the most likely reason, there's no reason to say it's anything but, is that we're actually looking at two different compounds that have very similar mass. Um, and just to highlight them, there they are. So each of them has their own isotope pattern. Uh, they just happen to be very close to each other. And this is why resolution is so important. So if our resolution was not as high as it is, then every one of these peaks would show up broader than, than they appear here, so they would look like that. But once they're that broad, you no longer distinguish these two peaks. They're just one on top of the other. So to really know what your masses are, you need to have nice sharp peaks so that you can distinguish closely spaced compounds in the mass spectrometer. 
Okay, I mentioned this, this issue about mass to charge and knowing what is the charge in the first place because nothing says in here, well, this has a charge of plus one or plus two. But you have to have a way of knowing what the charge is, otherwise we won't really know what the mass is. And it's really easy to see that, and it comes from the isotopes. So all you need to do is look at the spacing between the isotopes. So pulling out this example here, 842.9 to 843.4, you notice that the mass spacing isn't 1 anymore. The mass spacing is 0 0.5. So that's consistent all the way across. It's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, all the way up. Now, how did that, ma that mass spacing of 0 0.5 come to be? Well, this came because this compound doesn't have a charge of 1. It has a charge of 2. So the mass is actually double the mass that we see here. Um, and then doubling that mass, you have to realize that we've also added an extra proton in there. But if you take these masses and you divide by the charge of 2, that means those isotopes that used to have a spacing of 1 will now get squished in to a spacing of 0.5. So this one has a charge state of 2 simply by the, the spacing between them. And of course, if you see something with a charge state of 3, you can probably figure out the gap between these will be 0 0.33. Eventually, it'll reach a point where these, these spaces get so close to each other. So if something happened to have a mass, uh, sorry, a charge state of 10, these would get really close to each other, and then it would get hard to distinguish the two. But we can easily resolve the charge state of plus 2. So that's a very important feature. You do have to know what the charge is. Once we know the charge, we know the mass. We know exactly what we're dealing with.